Hello and welcome again. This video will be part three out of four analyzing the Quran's 18th chapter, Surat al kaf with the story of Gog and Magog. In this video, I'll be looking at the Islamic narrative on this myth, and in the next video, I'll be looking at the origins of this story and how it appears that the Islamic story seems to be nothing short of plagiarism from ancient legends. Let's read the verses on Gog and Magog. They appear in two chapters in the Quran. In the chapter of the cave, we are told a man with two horns, Dhul Qarnayn, our friend from the previous video who found the sun setting into a muddy spring somewhere on earth. After finding the sun setting in a muddy spring, then seeing it rising in the east near some people who had no shelter from it, he took another road. Then he followed another course, until when he reached a place between the two mountains, he found on that side of them a people who could hardly understand a word. They said, O oh, Dhul Qarnayn, surely Gog and Magog make mischief in the land. Shall we then pay you a tribute on condition that you should raise a barrier between us and them? He said, That in which my Lord has established me is better. Therefore you only help me with workers. I will make a fortified barrier between you and them. Bring me blocks of iron. Until when he had filled up the space between the two mountain sides, he said, Blow until when he had made it fire. He said, Bring me molten brass, which I may pour over it. So they were not able to scale it, nor could they make a hole in it. So here we have large tribes of mischievous people called Gog and Magog who were trapped by Dhul Qarnayn. He builds a huge metal barrier between the two peaks of mountains to trap these people in. But they're not going to be trapped there forever. Oh no, the Quran told us one day they will break free and cause absolute havoc on the earth. Until the Gog and Magog people are let through their barrier and they swiftly swarm from every hill. The authentic narrations in Islam tell us there are ten signs to look out for for things that will happen before the Day of Judgment. One of those things is Gog and Magog working their way through their barrier to come out and cause utter chaos. So mainstream Muslim belief is that these two tribes of Gog and Magog have been trapped behind a metal wall for thousands of years and will remain there until we approach the final strait of the end times. Now, let's just think about that for a second. Imagine we have a large group of people who belong to troublesome tribes. Dhul Qarnayn comes along and builds a big fat wall. You'll have to excuse my primitive artwork here. These people are now standing behind this big wall. Can't they just walk around the side of one of the mountains? If we're talking about a spherical earth, one wall between two mountains is never sufficient as a permanent tool of incarceration. It would though make a little more sense on a flat earth if this tribe was somewhere near the edge. We know that this wall should be huge because of the sheer number of the people who are supposedly trapped behind it. The Quranic verse detailing the time they are set free tells us they swiftly swarm from every hill. If they are a lost tribe of five or six people, then they might be hard to find. But if there's at least hundreds of them, then it's ridiculous to suggest they've evaded us all this time along with their huge metal wall. The Bible mentions Gog and Magog in several places and also predicts their emergence near the end times in the book of Revelation where it tells us, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. So we can see that Gog and Magog are actually very numerous in the Bible. It says, in number, they are like sand on the seashore. So let's now look at a few hadiths here to get a sense of their overall number from an Islamic narrative. In this hadith from Sahih Muslim, we get an explanation for the 10 signs of Judgment Day. Yeah, yeah, that was probably my favorite film growing up. Never realized at the time that it will be the only Judgment Day I see. But anyway, then Allah would send Gog and Magog and they would swarm down from every slope. The first of them would pass the Lake of Tiberias and drink out of it. And when the last of them would pass, he would say, there was once water there. So this Lake Tiberius is another name for the Sea of Galilee. The Hadith states it dries up. In some variations, it tells us Gog and Magog would line up to drink out of it, and the tail end of the queue would be all the way back in Iraq. The Sea of Galilee contains around 4 trillion litres of water. Humans are meant to drink 2 litres a day, and not much beyond that. But let's assume for argument's sake Gog and Magog drink 10 times as much as the rest of us. For that lake to empty as the Hadith states, we would need 200 billion people drinking those excessive amounts in order for it to dry up. That's nearly 30 times as much as the current world population. So we're getting the impression that the numbers of Gog and Magog are actually quite ridiculous. Now in this next Hadith from Sahih Bukhari, we have God having a chat with Adam. This discussion is taking place on Judgment Day. Then Allah will say to Adam, Bring out the people of the fire. Adam will say, What? How many are the people of the fire? Allah will say, Out of every thousand, take out 999. At that time, children will become hoary-headed and every pregnant female will drop her load. And you will see the people as if they were drunk, yet not drunk. But Allah's punishment will be very severe. 
That news distressed the companions of the Prophet too much, and they said, O oh, Allah's Messenger, who amongst us will be that man, the lucky one out of 1,000 who will be saved from the fire? He said, Have the good news that 1,000 will be from Gog and Magog, and the one to be saved will be from you. So in this hadith, classified as authentic, Muhammad tries to scare his followers by telling them that 999 people out of every 1,000 are destined to go to hell. Seeing their reaction of dejection, as they all but lose hope for salvation, he conveniently remembers he missed a crucial part out of that statement to get morale back up again. He tells them, aha, but wait, Gog and Magog are in fact so numerous that out of every 1,000 who reach hell, 999 will be from Gog and Magog. Incidentally, if you believe in this hadith, have you ever stopped to ask how it would be fair of a god to punish so many people with such horrific torture in hell, and only allow 0.1% of humans to make it into heaven, with 99.9% .9 going to hell? Surely you don't think this ratio is just or fair in any way. If this life is just a test, as Muslims would say, then the test is way too hard for our intellectual capacity as human beings, and thus blatantly unfair. Anyway, back to the numbers of these people. Let's do a bit of maths here. We're going to assume that Judgment Day... No. We are going to assume Judgment Day is around the corner, and the world is about to end as the population will just keep increasing as time goes on. The number of people alive on Earth today is close to 7.4 billion. But if we are to add up all the people who have ever lived, the estimate is 108 billion humans altogether. By the way, as usual, all claims made in the video, including these figures, are referenced in the description box. So given the maths here, we're expecting roughly half of those 108 billion to go to heaven and half to go to hell. So around 54 billion in heaven and 54 billion in hell of people who we are aware of and can roughly account for. Given that Gog and Magog have never been found, discovered, and aren't really accounted for in official statistics, we have to now assume that 54 billion people going to hell only form 0.1% of the total number of those in hell. This gives us a grand total of 54 trillion people who will actually go to hell, of whom 53.95 trillion people are from Gog and Magog, and are currently stuck behind a metal wall that no one seems to be able to find. So how much space would Gog and Magog take up if we are to believe this authentic hadith? Let's say the average width of a man is only 50 centimeters with a depth of 20 centimeters. We'll ignore height as it will be irrelevant for this calculation. This will give us 10 people standing in every square meter. Let's imagine the entirety of Gog and Magog are all squashed together with absolutely no room to move an inch in any direction. 5.4 trillion meters squared becomes 5.4 million kilometers squared. So to fit all of Gog and Magog with absolutely no room for them to move whatsoever, we would require an area of land that is the size of India and Argentina put together. By comparison, the current human population can all fit into New York City. 53.95 trillion people would measure around 27 trillion meters standing shoulder to shoulder. That is 27 billion kilometers. To put that into perspective, that is roughly 180 times longer than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So Google Earth and its predecessor, Earth Viewer, have given everyone access to the surface of the planet since 2001. People have looked across every inch of the planet's surface and found this heart shape in New Caledonia, this side profile of a woman in Alberta in Canada, and these red lips in the deserts of Sudan. You'd think the existence of this huge metal wall between two mountains would have been seen by now. I feel pretty bad for Muslim apologists here, as there's really nothing that they can say besides lie once more on the Qur'an's narrative regarding this myth. But some Muslims, like apologist Yasser Qadi, prefers not to lie here, as they do take their scripture seriously, and prefer the good old no-comment approach. If somebody were to say, where are they now? There are some modern scholars, and I'm just going to mention this in passing, who say, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not hiding in some cave or some place. They're actually living in the lands of the Far East. And this wall is the Great Wall of China. Now this is something that some people have said. That's the only reason I'm mentioning this, right? But the fact of the matter is that that doesn't explain anything. Because the Quran tells us this wall was made out of what? What are the two materials that are mentioned? Iron and copper. The Great Wall of China is not made out of iron and copper, right? Another thing is the ahadith clearly indicate Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not right now mixing with people. They're in some place separated from mankind. So if somebody were to say, how can we believe these ahadith when Google Earth has mapped the whole world? <laughs> we can zoom in and see everything around us. And there is no massive land hidden from mankind. The response is, Allahu A'lam. If we believe in the ahadith, this is what the ahadith tell us. I mean, that's just incredible. Even when they realize there are huge holes in the story, 
and they acknowledge they cannot answer why the allegedly imprisoned tribes and giant metal wall are nowhere to be seen, they just shrug their shoulders and say, God knows. It's unapologetically promoting blind faith. So what exactly are these people doing right now, you may think? Well, according to this authentic hadith, they are digging at the wall every single day, nearly reaching the end, and just as they're about to break through, they stop work for that day and go to sleep. During the night, Allah builds it back, and they wake up to see the wall back to where it stood originally. They are apparently so stupid that they will continue digging tirelessly like this every single day for thousands of years, until one day one of them says, we will finish it off tomorrow, God willing. Ah, the good old Inshallah. And then God will think, well, I can't, I can't screw, screw them now. now. They did say God willing after all. So he leaves their progress alone, and they wake up the next day and finish off the job, before somehow creating absolute chaos across the world with their primitive weapons. Are Gog and Magog really that stupid? When you see this pattern of nightly regeneration repeating itself, can they not just split the workload into day and night shifts across 24 hours to get the job done? Can they not sleep right next to the point in the wall that they have dug up to? So moving on to who are the Gog and Magog. Now Muslim scholars believe they are humans primarily because of the hadith mentioned earlier, stating they were descendants of our mythical ancestors, Adam and Eve. But there are some hadiths telling us that these tribes had some bizarre shapes to them. There's a narration which is not classified as authentic, but is still believed by some Muslims today, which states that Gog and Magog are three types of people. The first are really tall, like palm trees. The second are as wide as they are tall, so basically square-shaped. And the third group have ears so large that they use their ears to wrap themselves with as blankets when they go to sleep. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa one of the narration he said, Gog and Magog are not from Adam alayhi salam. So they're different creatures. And then he, 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 he mentioned them by, they have a big ears. Their ears are from their head down. All, their ears are very big that they, they, they sleep inside it. Like for example, when they going to sleep, he put the first ear down and then he sleep on it and then he cover himself with the second ear. Yeah, yeah, he's like a egg. He will become like an egg from their ears. So those people are from different dimension. Why they have big ears? Because they live very long. Now that guy has a long video on Dal Qur'an and it's dull and boring, but very entertaining for those of you like me who often completely waste their time listening to such material. A link is available to watch his entire video. He even claims that the Qur'an talks about wormholes and neutrinos in its verse explaining Muhammad's journey on the winged mule. Now, looking at the origins of Gog and Magog, we see this report in Tabari's History, Volume 2, page 21, where it says, Noah begat three, each one of whom begat three, Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Sham begat the Arabs, Persians, and Byzantines, in all of whom there is good. Japheth begat the Turks, Slavs, Gog and Magog, in none of whom there is good. Hmm. That's a bit racist there to suggest there's no good in any ethnic Turks or Slavs, but let's read on. Ham begat the Copts, Sudanese, and Berbers. Then it says, Ham begat all those who were black and curly-haired, while Japheth begat all those who were full-faced with small eyes, and Sham begat everyone who is handsome of face with beautiful hair. Noah prayed that the hair of Ham's descendants would not grow beyond their ears, and that wherever his descendants met the children of Shem, the latter would enslave them. So according to this source, Noah wanted the Arabs, Byzantines, and Persians to enslave Copts, Sudanese, and Berbers, the Amazigh people, wherever they found them. What else was said about these tribes? We understand that Muhammad appears to claim during his life that their release was imminent. In this authentic hadith narrated by his wife, Zainab bin Chahash, she says the following, the Prophet got up from his sleep with a flushed red face and said, None has the right to be worshipped but Allah. Woe to the Arabs from this great evil that is nearly approaching them. Today a gap has been made in the wall of Gog and Magog like this. It was asked, Shall we be destroyed, though there are righteous people among us? The Prophet said, Yes, if evil increased. So it appears that Muhammad wakes up after a nightmare, fearing Gog and Magog are almost out. Funny thing is, they don't seem to have managed to increase the size of that hole for over a thousand years since. Besides, this seems to contradict the earlier hadith which states that the wall is getting replenished every day. Also, a Muslim may say, the hadith says they will only be released if evil increased. Well, after Muhammad, some of his caliphs were assassinated, we had several wars between his companions, and the Kaaba was destroyed more than once. So, what else are they looking for in terms of evil increasing? Let's look at another authentic hadith narration from Muhammad. The Muslims will use the bows, arrows, and shields of Gog and Magog as firewood for seven years. Are we really expecting the Muslims to be using these bows, arrows, and shields as firewood for seven years? Doesn't this show us that Muhammad couldn't really imagine what the world would be like in the future? Doesn't this show he didn't quite grasp how people will eventually get energy for light and heat? 
But I guess as a Muslim you either say this hadith is fabricated, despite it being authentic, or you just accept it blindly and tell us that Muslims will in fact, somehow, and for some reason, use Gog and Magog's leftovers as firewood for a whole seven years. I was going to conclude this video by mentioning the origins of this mythical legend about Velcarain and Gog and Magog, but I feel this video is long enough as it is. So I will end it here and make a second part to this video, where I can take a detailed look at the origins of these myths, and where Islam seems to have got these stories from. Thank you very much for watching. You are free to mirror any of my videos. I've seen a number of people who have translated them into other languages, and I'm always more than happy for anybody to do that if they have the time to do so. Until next time...